ok good evening so today before starting speaking about uh, probably the last topic of this course that is controlled experiment that is the, the we call it the scientific way of uh, assessing user interfaces interactive system and other kind of uh, prototype of work uh, just a couple of announcements you may already have seen this on slack but uh, let me also put here tomorrow no class there is uh, the polytechnico decided to interrupt all the teaching activities between 10 and 1 pm that class will be uh, we will do that class the content of the class next thursday the 16th of january from 11 30 to 11 in a room uh, i think 13 s so we'll have one hour and a half in the lab in labinf as usually for supervised work group then we move in room 13 s for one hour and a half where we have we will have the um, a simulation with a solution of a written exam mm -hmm. so we will have an entire exam session in that class and then briefly the solution for those exercises like a simulation of a real exam that will also happen shortly mm -hmm. so this is these are the two news uh, for today so you can close this and we can start speaking about controlled experiment so first topic of the year happy new year um, last topic of the course so just to recap mm, we uh, before christmas before winter holidays we spoke about usability testing and you will, will be asked on tuesday in the lab this Thursday in the lab to start preparing the plan the script for the usability testing of your prototype that is part as a reminder of milestone number four that is due seven days before the day you decided to give the oral exam so you may have short time if you plan to do the oral exam the project presentation in february longer time if you plan to have the oral exam in september but again, the preparation of the script will be in the lab next Thursday so that you can have also a feedback from Professor Corno that will be there. So the idea of usability testing was uh, let's find someone and we will ask two or three people for your project, someone to use our application, our system, so that we will get some feedback on how to improve it and it was anecdotally and mostly observation driven you observe people doing something some task in your um, with your application you say okay it's usable it's more or less usable they understand how to work or not control experiments instead are the most scientific part because they are hypothesis driven you formulate an hypothesis among a comparison between two different apps, two different systems, two different prototypes, two different kind of things, and you perform some experiment and you analyze data in a scientific way from those experiments. So if you want to summarize, it's more, it's more similar to, we want to verify if user or our application perform a given task faster, with less error, with more precision, whatever you want, than our competitor app so there is a parallel or if a choice that we made in a screen it's better than another choice that we make and make in that, in that screen we will see next time whatever it is next time uh, that for instance for the obama campaign some years ago in the united states they had an experiment a sort of a control experiment in which they have the main page with sign up and the main page with learn more 
for sign up people on the website and they discover that the changing this button sign up versus learn more one of these two versions get more people sign up in the website just this change of sign up versus learn more plus other media over there picture mainly but this button change was something that get more people on the website significantly more people on the website and this is some sort of uh, controlled experiments it's in the wild so it's not really controlled in the lab but they have two different version and they have some people in the one version some other people in one version they compare results and so on they have an hypothesis to verify so a control evaluation is a control experiment or a user study it's a evaluation of a specific aspect of some interactive behavior typically is old in a lab because it's controlled you need to control most of the things you have a prototype two prototypes you have maybe to record you need specific hardware to do this so typically it's in the lab sometimes when you compare for instance two websites like in the Obama case or also uh, Facebook some years ago did a sort of comparison some users of Facebook app on the smartphone see the menu bar on the bottom other in the top and they measure some things about how these two different group of people behave with the same application with a slight change in the menu they are in the wild so they are out in the world but typically control experiment are in the lab and the evaluator decided chooses an hypothesis to be tested we would like to verify if users perform a given task faster, for instance, than another application. So some hypothesis to verify. And most appropriately, we don't verify an hypothesis like this. We try to reject a null hypothesis. We will see this later on. But it's only, only it's based on hypothesis we give a specific single hypothesis not just let's see if the app is is working well or if it's usable but we have a specific hypothesis to verify measurable specific hypothesis to verify or to reject in the case of a null hypothesis and we have various experimental conditions to consider but we have still the three main step that uh, we had for usability evaluation we have to plan the study we have to run the study and we have to analyze the results of the study the main difference from the usability test is in the planning stage and in the analysis stage the running of the study in a lab is very very closely to running a usability study you get people in so you're a participant you have tasks you have the, a prototype, two prototypes maybe, or two pages of a pro two identical, let's say, most identical pages of the same prototype to test with participants, you collect the data, same things that happen for usability testing. But how, what you are measuring, what are you testing is different and how you analyze data is much, much more different because again, this is hypothesis driven and this is more scientific. So let's start from planning the study. We will skip running because again, it's very, very close uh, to usability testing, running, and we will have a look at analyzing data that will involve some statistics. So do you like statistics? Not so much. We will not go uh, deep into statistics, just a couple of information. Uh, we will have one statistical method, non parametric statistical method for analysis, but it's really simple to compute, so it's easy to, to do also on paper. More complex statistical methods are reported, just the name, and then if you need it in the future, you're interested, you can buy a book of statistics and uh, have a look at those methods that specifically that are used in human computer interaction they are also used for instance in software engineering but they are let's say a little bit of the scope for uh, for the course because we are not doing a statistic course obviously 
Um, so, planning the study. First of all, six step. First of all, choose what do you want to study. Which is your question that you want to answer. And the question, as the example before, must be narrow and testable. So what they call before measurable, testable. You cannot understand, I would like to have to know if my application behaves better than another application. What is better? In which sense better? But it's, it's I gave uh, the users made less error than other application. Users are more engaged, more sign in into my application than other. Uh, user make less mistake with my application than with another or by putting the menu here is uh, more quickly to find something in the menu than putting the menu in another side of the application. So a question, narrow and testable. From the question, you then have to choose the hypothesis. Like before, I would like to, we, you transform the question in an hypothesis, better in a null hypothesis, and you add to this hypothesis some variables, and we will see what we mean for variables in a minute, and some measure. So what you are going to measure effectively, time, uh, number of pixels, number of logins, what you are measuring. Then, as for the usability testing, you have to select your participant. Then, as for the usability testing, they must be your target population. For decide the experimental method that you will use. And there are mainly two experimental methods that you can use. So it's almost a binary cho choice. And, or you can combine these two methods together to generate a third method, but overall there are two methods plus one. Then, after designing the experimental method, the participant, the hypothesis with related variables, you can finally, let's say, write what we call the script, write the procedure, and especially write the task that you will give participant, participant to prove your hypothesis or to disprove, to reject your null hypothesis, if we imagine for a moment that the null hypothesis is just the opposite of this. So you write the task, and which are the tasks? It depends from, obviously, the, what you are going to study. So if you are going to study whether clicking the Learn More button and the Sign Up button generates more uh, login in the website, probably the task is just having people clicking that Sign Up on the website. So it's, it's already defined in the hypothesis. In other case, the task could be more complex, different tasks could, could be not only one task, but multiple tasks can be defined, depends from the user study that you design to plan. And then after this, before running the, the study, you have to decide which statistical test you are going to use to analyze the results. Decide, because it may change according to the statistical test, you have different measures to take or you have different participants to take. Or, you, or if you choose a statistical test, you may, it's better not to have one of these two experimental methods, but the other. So it also has some implication of what you select before. So these six steps are obviously not to be done, most of them sequentially, but a little bit more iterative. Once they find the hypothesis and the participants, the experimental method, the statistical task, test and the task are something that could be done more or less in parallel or some with some iteration. So let's start from some, let's say, definition that we will give. Let's start from the easiest one, the participants. Participants in control experiment are also called subjects. This is terminology that uh, control experiment is also what happens in medicine. You have a control experiment, you give a drug to some people and you give another treatment to other people and see the effect of this treatment, how it's going. If it's going well, if it's a placebo treatment, if there's some value in the blood uh, changes or not. So this is terminology that is 
similar to many, many uh, different uh, kind of uh, experiments that involve humans, humans being. So participant, we call people participants, but the, the let's say this historical term is subjects. And participants, when you choose participants, should be representative of your target population, as always, and they must be in a sufficient number. Obviously, the selection of participant is, as always, vital to the success of the experiment, as for the usability testing, as for the interviews and the observation you did, and about the sample size. To give you a number, the sample size of this, it really depends from the experiment. But if we, if we take as a reference the number given by Nielsen for usability testing, the TIS, how many people for usability testing, at least? Five. If we take the number, at least double it. Ten, it's fine. But again, it strongly depends from the kind of study that you are going to do and also from the statistical method you are going to use. Because, for instance, for some statistical method, you need to have at least 20 measure, 20 people maybe involved, 20 different conditions overall. So it's, it's something that it, it really depends. But less than 10 is it's difficult to have then some results that are statistical significant or statistical important valid because again this is not just the system usability scale that is just a qualitative indication this is we are trying to do let's say science here so we should have a, a appropriate number of participants that try our uh, system our experiment and this is this is part all the things that you already know about participant recruiting participant speaking with participants uh, same participant that uh, it's not their fault if something doesn't work like usability testing all still old and apply so we can stop speaking about participant and we can speak about hypothesis and variable the hypothesis is as you may imagine, the prediction of the outcome of the study. What do you want to demonstrate? I, want, I would like to know that my application is faster than the competitor. It's generate less error. This is my goal, let's say, the objective. I would really have that the outcome is this. Is this. Maybe experimental data say that my competitor application is better than mine in that, in that sense, but this is my my will, my wish. I would like to have uh, my application uh, better for what concerns time than my competitor one. And the hypothesis is typically framed, it's not typically, is framed in terms of variables that are things to manipulate and measure to test the hypothesis. And we will see two main types of variable and three other not main times but just just to know type of variables that can be used in a controlled experiment and the hypothesis as i said before is in the form of a null hypothesis to be rejected so what happens and this is a preview is that you don't say uh, i would like to know my app is faster than the other but what you are saying is there is no difference, no significant difference in speed, in velocity, whatever you want, from my app to the other app. This is the null hypothesis. There is no difference between the two things. And the alternate hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis is that my app is faster than the other. But you want to reject the null hypothesis. You want to really want to reject the fact that the two things that you are comparing are with no difference at all and by rejecting them you according to st the statistical tests you are going to use you can demonstrate that your app is faster or that they are just different from one another hmm? variables variables are the central point all of this because it's what you are going to manipulate and impl and they have implication uh, for the um, statistical study that you are going to use 
there are two main types of variables. And notice that these variables are for the specific experiment you are going to do. So they can change from one experiment to another. We, they can change also with the same setup of a in lab, for instance, uh, study between one hypothesis and another hypothesis. Maybe you don't change your application, but you change the hypothesis you want to, the null hypothesis you want to reject. So these variables are really focused on the specific study experiment that you are going to do. So we have two main types of variables. The independent variable and the dependent variable. The independent variable is the element or are the elements, you could have more than one independent variable, of the experiment that is manipulated or controlled to produce different condition for performing the comparison. They could be two, three, four interface style, two number of, me number of menu items to compare or icon design. And each of these can have then different values that are called level. You may have two interface style, three interface style, these are called levels. Independent variables are also called factors. So when you see factor or independent variable, they are synonyms. And we will have an example of this uh, independent variable. Dependent variable instead, are what you are trying to measure. They are characteristic of that specific experiment that you measure. Be they are called dependent because their value of this measure is dependent on the change made from the independent variable. If you change independent variable, you measure new things. You, may you measure maybe the time taken one times for the first interface time and then another time from zero from this for the second interface style. So they are dependent on which kind of uh, independent variable you are manipulating. And these uh, dependent variables are just measure, what we call the measure, like for instance the time taken, the number of, of error, uh, the number of clicks, just things that are typically measurable uh, in a study. So let's take again this sentence, it's not really an hypothesis. So let's try to say which is the independent and which is the dependent variable. So we have the sentence, we want to verify if a user of our app perform a task faster, whatever it is, than our competitor app. And I already selected in yellow and green two parts. One is our app, then our competitor, and the other is faster with fewer error and so on. So which of these two may map to the independent variable? We can use this as, let's say, an inspiration for independent variable. The, the yellow sentence or the green one? The yellow. The yellow. Because independent variables are things that we are manipulating. We are manipulating our app versus the competitor app. So, obviously, if the yellow is an independent variable, the green is a dependent variable. Because it's something that we measure. We measure faster, we measure time, fewer error, we measure number of mistakes. We are measuring things. While up, then our competitor up, we are not measuring anything in that sentence. Hmm? So yeah, that, that's the answer. Another example, a little bit different. Uh, we want to test whether selection speed in menu, in a given menu, improve as the number of items in the menu decrease. So if you have, you have a menu with three items, for instance, and you want to say that if you have three items, you have to select just one of these three randomly, by suggest, as suggested by the evaluator, it's the time to select one of these three is less than the time that you need to select one of the seven in another menu. So this is what you want to, to demonstrate. That selecting one out, out of a three items in a menu 
takes less time than selecting one in seven, 11, 1000 menu item in a single menu. So here it's a little bit, uh, let's say maybe complex than before, not, not a lot. Uh, let's try to identify again the independent variable, one or more, the level of that independent variable, and the dependent variable. The dependent is the speed, the independent, the number, and the level. Mostly. Anyone else? Before showing the solution? So the independent is the number of menu item, obviously. The, sp the dependent is the speed of the selection, for instance, in second. Hmm? Obviously, hopefully, not in minutes, in second. And the level are how many, is not written there, but it's something that you have to decide. How many menu items, different set of menu items you are going to use in your study? One, two, three, eleven. This number, one, two, three, eleven, are the levels. So if we, for instance, say we want to test whether selection speed in a menu improve as the number of menu items decrease, and we are going to use a menu item with three, a menu with three items, and then compare with a menu with five items, because we need a comparison, and a menu with seven items, we can compare also 11 things, in theory, no problem. We have three level, because we have a menu item with three items, uh, we have menu with three items, a menu with five items, and a menu with seven items. That is three different conditions to compare. So one independent variable, the number of menu items, we'll have a menu, three conditions for that uh, menu, three items, five items, seven items, and we measure for each of them the speed of the selection. So we want to select the first one in the first three item menu, in the second five item menu, in the third seven item menu. And for selecting the first one, 20 people took three seconds. And then we, for each, because no change. And then we want to select the last one. So 20 people to select the third, the fifth, and the seventh, item of these three menu take three seconds, five seconds, and seven seconds. So we, we start collecting data, the speed of the menu item selection. So we say, that for instance, that for uh, uh, three, the, the menu item with three, we have a mean of three seconds for selecting any item. I just imagining some number. For the five menu item we have 4 seconds, and for the 7 menu item we have 11 seconds. So it seems to be a decrease in the speed, because 3 seconds for the 3 menu items, 11 seconds for the 7 menu items, so shorter the menu, shorter the selection. It seems, by looking at this data. So we have an independent variable, 3 levels, that are the 3 conditions to compare, and something that we are measuring every time from scratch for each participant. Is it clear up to now? Okay, because things will not uh, go simple from here, so just to be sure. So uh, I say before that we have three uh, levels that are three, uh, I call it also condition, hmm? because we can define the experimental condition this way, task execution during the experiment select the first menu of, let's say, let's say in this way, select the last menu of the first three item menu, select the last menu in the five items menu, and select the last item voice in the seven item menu. Three tasks different, the same task repeated in three different 
way in three different in the, the three different conditions, the three different level. So each level of an independent variable requires one experimental condition. Three minus three condition. The same task repeated three times. Or you can have three tasks, the three tasks repeated three times. So in the end you have nine tasks. Three, three identical tasks repeated three times because you have three levels. So uh, experiment with just an independent variable are the easiest one, the nicest one, but more complex experiments exist and they can have more than one independent variable. Each one with, so, with, it, with its own level. And experimental conditions should account for all the combination of levels. That's mean this. Same game as before, without a dependent variable that obviously is still, the dependent variable here is still the speed, time, time taken. Uh, so let's change the example a little bit. Same as before, we added something. We want to test whether selection speed in a menu improve, let's say decrease, as the number of menu improve, sorry, as the number of menu items decrease and text or icon are used as label. Just to picture this for you vocally. You have a three, let's be four, items menu. One time you get the three uh, item menu with label one, label two, label three, and then you have the same three item menu but instead of a text as a label, you have icons as, or icon plus text, no matter. But it's different, it's another condition. And then you have the five menu item with five textual value and then with five uh, icons. And then you have the seven, as before, menu item with seven text and then another time with seven icon instead of the text. This is what this, the number of menu item decreases and text or icon are used as, as labels. So, independent variables, how many they are? Two. Two. And they are? The number of items and the type of label. Correctly. The number of menu item and this text versus icon, the type of label. How many level per independent variable? Well, for the first one, it's easy because it's the same three as before. Or we can imagine the first three as before. It's not written there that there are three levels for the menu item. This is something that we deci I decided when I prepared this slide. And in the other case, the level are already as are written and are two. Uh, it's easy. Uh, so we have. For number of menu item, three level, as before, three, five, and seven, for instance, and for text versus icon, the type of label, it's better, the type of level. Uh, we have two levels, text and, for instance, icon. How many condition we are going to test in the end? Before we say three levels, only number of item, three condition. We have people testing the three, uh, item menu, then people testing the five, and then people testing the seven item menu. Now we have also this text versus icon. So in the end, how many conditions we have to, to test with the user? Six. Do you agree? Three level for the first, and do two level for the second one. So we have, for, for instance, for the three menu item, we will have participant. We will have participant before conducting one, two, three. Don't, don't matter. Uh, task with a textual label, then the same task with the three item menus with the icon. Then we will have participant experimenting with the five item menu before with textual label, and then they will have the same identical task as before. Also, as the beginning, with the icon version, and then again, 
the same three tasks before in the seven item with textual and then the same three tasks in the seven item with um, icons and you measure time taken from the start to the click on a given label every time six times and so you have at the end a table with here here participant this is something You will have uh, i don't know participant one and this will be five second three second seven second eight second eleven second and whatever it is then and then you have participant number two with some number here as well so for each of these conditions, you measure the dependent variable from scratch on the same task so that you can perform a comparison. So uh, visually, you can already perform a comparison. So if all participants behave like participant number one, you may say that, for instance, uh, three menu item is better than the other one. Maybe it's not true. It's just by chance, but in this case, uh, we had super performing uh, participant for the three menu item and that there is no preference between text or icon with this number because there there is a little bit a change but then seven and eight and then eleven and ten not really a change uh, we can say that for the three menu item maybe hmm, some hints on having also the icon is better but it's better for time but it's just at a glance. If we have 20 participants identically like participant number one, that spoiler will never happen. It's really easy that you may have maybe here seven and here an 11 and here a nine and here a five and here another 11 and an 11. This is something that may happen in the real world. Totally different number that you have to figure out why and if they make sense or that is participant number two that is, has got the flu and is uh, working randomly or whatever it is. But um, that is. So six condition because you have three multiple times two um, different level into different independent variable and you again during the, the study you fill up a table with this in the end of the study you memorize all this number and fill up a table with this so the, the next question is how many independent variable we can it's better to have so obviously the limit is the sky but maybe it's not it's it's really a smart move to have 11 independent variables with multiple level not only for uh, creating a table like this that obviously if you have 11 independent variables with multiple items with multiple levels it will never end in a piece of paper or in a computer but also to store this also for participant to experiment with 100 different condition at one time but except of this if we imagine that we have super awesome people deciding to live alive in a, in, in a lab to experiment this in an hypothetical world, is there, uh, let's say, scientifically or statistically an upper limit? So the, the answer is yes. Uh, so. The answer is yes, and that in this short version, a good experiment design is one that limits the number of independent variables to one or two. Three, if you are really, really lucky. Or in some very particular case. But most of the experiment, one or two independent variables. With various level, it depends from the kind of independent variable. Why this is 
something to consider because when you set up an experiment, you, you know for the observation, or you will know from the usability study, you ask people to come there. And then if you experiment maybe one independent variable and then you are interested in something else, you have to, uh, you have to ask people to come back again in a one month and then do maybe an experiment that is really, really close to the previous one and then you say oh there is another variable and then call people another time so this is quite boring for you and for uh, time consuming also for participants and also participants if you are administering the same interface with the same comparison they might also they might also be need to be different people because they already see the interface they already see how it works so it's better at different people so it's a lot of work so what happens is that uh, people that is doing this experiment try to put together i don't want to say as much of independent variable as possible but maybe just not test one independent variable and then after one week say okay maybe i need to add another variable so just to think well about how many things you are going you are going to you would like to experiment you would like to uh, compare and collect in your application or in any application. But the golden number is one or two and three at most. Uh, not because it's, there are obviously problems from fatigue or for participants and so on, but also because statistically it becomes quite a mess. Because if we have a look at the facts among variables, so an experiment with one independent variable, let's imagine just one level for each, includes a main effect on the, de on the um, dependent variable. That is, you have just one number at the end to consider, or just a couple of numbers. If you have two independent variables, you have two main effects. One effect for the first variable, one effect for the second variable, and one interaction effect. That is how the first variable and the second may change the results. Because here, let me clean this. Here, in the moment you are, you say there is textual label and icon label, you are changing the condition of experiment. Because here you are introducing icons. So the effect is due to the three menu item, to the five or two icons from here to here. So there is an effect the interaction between these two variables in, in the numbers because you are inserting things in your original question. So if you got low number here and here and here, it's because the icon or it's because the three, five, seven menu item? It depends. So this is something that statistically can be computed and can give an indication on whether there is an influence and how much this influence is. But we have the two independent variables to measure and also this effect among these two. But just to give you an idea, we don't need to go deep on this. This is what happened with two independent variables. So three effects, two main effects, one for each variable and a uh, interaction effects between the first and the second variable. That is called two A because there are two variables. If we take uh, one with three interaction uh, independent variable, we have, as before, three effect independently, separately for each independent variable, and four interaction var interaction effects. So notice that we move from one to four because because we have three two A. The first with the second, the first with the third, and the second with the third. And one three-way, the first with the second with the third. And so these are 
in total seven effects. And if we imagine four independent variables, we have 14 effects. And this is the reason why we need to limit the number to one or two. Because all these effects, the three-way effects, it's a really, really difficult effect to consider in the results, to say if your results are good or not. It's really, really difficult with the three-way effects. Don't let me start with the four-way effects, as in four interaction variable. So also, to have good results, reliable results, it's better to stop here in the second uh, with two main effects and one interaction effects. These three interaction independent variable is just the borderline, so if needed you can come here, but don't go over. So typically one or two independent variable for these statistical effects in the results, about the reliability of the results. And this is two main variables, and the hypothesis uh, should be realized according to the variables. The one that we said before, they were just example, but again, the hypothesis, uh, a real hypothesis could be, uh, for instance, there is, uh, let's take this, hmm? the null hypothesis could be there is no difference in selection speed as the number of menu items decrease. This is the null hypothesis that I want to reject. I want to reject the fact that no matter how big are the menu items, there is no difference in selection of the menu voices, the menu item. This is the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis, that is something that we, the goal that we have is again that uh, there is a difference and possibly this difference is in our favor when menu items are less than when menu items are uh, a lot of it. And these are independent dependent variables. There are other three types of variables to consider. While the independent and the dependent variable are really needed for the hypothesis, these three other type of variables are to be considered to know the existence, especially the first two. Uh, there are three other types of variables, uh, control, random, and confounding. The control variables are variables that may influence a dependent variable, but they are not under investigation. You don't care. They could be dependent variable, but you are not measuring them. And you can have two approaches. You can control them, or you can put it random. So, for instance, uh, if you are testing an application on a computer, a desktop computer, the display size is a dependent variable, it may be a dependent variable. Or you say, I don't care, I will just fix it to 1080 pixel. The mouse cursor speed, I will fix it for every participant. So you, you understand that if you, uh, for instance, change, if you want to look at time and you change the cursor speed of the mouse between one participant to another, you are changing the number of the dependent variable. So you cannot change it randomly if you are interested in speed of selection, for instance. So this is something that you control. Maybe you control automatically because you don't change normally the, the, the mouse cursor speed. It's fixed, one value, don't matter. But if you use multiple computers, you have to assure that the same, for instance, cursor speed is present on both computers if you are measuring time of pointing and clicking with a mouse. Hmm? Uh, same things for the display size. In other uh, cases, also the chair height could be uh, a variable to control. Not to measure because it's not dependent, but maybe to control. If you're using a tracker, for instance, you should have the tracker more or less in front of the eyes of people. Uh, the type of smartphone. If you want to investigate uh, something in the settings of a given app, 
it may change if it's an Android or an iPhone because the operating system for settings are different. If you are comparing iPhone and uh, iOS with uh, Android, you may have obviously this as a dependent variable, but again, which version of iOS and which version of Android? And this could be the control variable. I would like to compare iOS 11 with Android 5. And I control this two number in a control variable. So some of them are just set up, you don't re really think about it. Others should be uh, think a little bit. Uh, and so these are control variables. And this is one approach. These are variables that are fixed and a nominal setting during the entire experiment. And if you don't want to be control freak, you can have random variables. So instead of trying to control every single variable, every single things, you can allow some variable to vary randomly or more or less randomly because you don't care, they don't impact the experiment. So typically, random variables are pertain to characteristic of participants. Gender. You maybe would like to have 50-50, 50, 50, 50 male, 50 female, for instance. But if they are 49 and 51, it's not maybe something for some kind of experiment really, really terrible. Or the hate of a person, you need a care about the hate of a person for, I don't know, testing a web application? Maybe not. Uh, or the hand size. For most things, you don't really care about hand size. If you want to control uh, uh, something related to the mouse, you may have some interest in also controlling the hand size. But typically, it's random. You don't even measure the hand size of your participant or the color of the eyes. These are just random variable. They, not, they don't even, while independent, the dependent variable needs to be written and also in the protocol that you, are, you wrote for a user study because you have to understand which, which are the independent variable because you set up the study in a table like the one I showed you before according to dependent variable. And you need to know which are the dependent variable because you need to measure things, you need to measure time, so you need to change the code, you need to have equipment to measure time, for instance, this variable could also be not written anywhere, just uh, especially the random one. And then there are confounding variables that are problematic. They are not to be written, but to be considered, especially in certain uh, circumstances in which we have uh, a lot of hardware, typically. Confounding variables are circumstances or condition that systematically change an independent variable, within an independent variable. And they're problematic because they change while you're measuring your independent variable, and so they can create problem in the measure of an independent variable, so in the result. So they are problematic uh, because if you have a confounding variable, at the end you don't know if the effect you served, the number you get, get at the end, are due to the independent variable or to the confounding variable. So let me put an example here. So imagine to have to, that you want to track uh, the people site in a monitor in two conditions, near where I'm looking and far away. And if I change I would like to know my, my hypothesis that is a change far away, uh, I change more quickly than uh, near my size change. So to do this, I need two cameras, probably. One here, on near to my eyes, to track the pupil, or on the screen on my computer to track the pupil near, and one maybe uh, more distance to track my pupil from there to understand what happens over there, not here. And so may, I may have, may use two cameras, one here and one there. And these two cameras may be different because this one should be really different from that one to get my pupil. 
using two different camera is a confounding variable. Better have two different camera with as different properties as um, is a confounding variable because I don't know in the end I don't know if the results that I get are because the camera that I have here near close to me is more precise than the other one for instance or vice versa so I don't know if the number that I get are influenced or not from the choice of hardware that I'm that I'm having so this is problematic because all the experiment with confounding variable should be throw away and start again and it's again it's not something really uh, good to do so how do you uh, avoid the confounding variable well for instance in this in this example with two cameras you can use the same camera for both applications you can find a camera that work well in near and work well in distance with more or less the same properties so that you are fixing you are controlling that variable you are not ignoring that and these are confounding variables it's not really simple to find like for instance in an application it's quite it's quite hard to have a confounding variable but you may have they can also came from the environment or uh, other things okay everything is clear about variables right now more or less yes so hypothesis as i said before the hypothesis is a prediction of the study outcome that is framed in terms of independent and dependent variable that means that a variation as we have seen the independent variable will probably cause a difference in the dependent variable we are expecting that three item menu get speed much lower than the seven so there's a difference in the dependent variable the hypothesis uh, this prediction this variation is done by disproving as i told you the null hypothesis that always as i told you it states that there is no difference in the dependent variable between the levels of the independent variables there is no difference in speed time, in selection time between the three, five, and seven menu item. This is the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis, once once again, is there is a difference, and this difference is significant, and hopefully this difference is in favor for the three item menu than the seven. And this difference is not just three versus five as we have seen before ah, there is a three there's a five and there is a seven so three and five is better done and it's not something like you will do for usability testing in which you get some opinion some comments from some feedback ah, it, this person makes some error here so probably this is problematic we can change it a little bit but this difference is evaluated statistically and some statistical measure produce value that can be compared with various levels significant that is if a result is statistically significant at a given level that typically is 95% or 99% or 0 0.05 or 0 0.0001 that difference would not, would not have occurred by chance so the null hypothesis can be rejected so you, if you have, have a result that has a probability to let's say happen the 99 percent of the time so you can reject your uh, null hypothesis and that difference that you are measuring that is a difference that happens in that way that can be generalized in that way the 99 percent of time with the same population with the same uh, item under observation uh, it's not something that happened by chance so it, it's it's reasonable that it will will be true so you can reject the null hypothesis and approve the uh, alternative hypothesis if something happens the 80 percent of time this is not statistically significant so you cannot reject the null hypothesis notice that i say you cannot reject the null hypothesis you cannot accept the null hypothesis there is a difference 
The difference is that uh, you cannot reject the null hypothesis, you cannot say the null hypothesis is false and have the alternative hypothesis approved, accepted. You cannot say that. But you cannot even say the null hypothesis is true and there is really no difference. You can say with that data, you don't really know. For sure, you cannot approve. You cannot reject the null hypothesis. But you cannot, you, cannot, you cannot say there is no difference. In my data, there is no enough information to support a rejection of the null hypothesis. You have to collect more data perform other analysis to try to reject your null hypothesis. This is something that is crucial in this kind of operation. Uh, let's say failing to rejecting a null hypothesis is not a fail of the experiment. It's just you don't have enough data, typically. Or there is something wrong in the experiment. Or it's fine. You can notice a trend and you need more data to, to support or not the trend. And this is about hypothesis. The other uh, ingredients, so uh, variables, hypothesis, is which kind of experimental methods we are going to use. And I told you before, we have two kinds of experimental methods that can be mixed together if needed. A between subject and a within subject. So you, you now understand why I call participant subjects, because they have uh, the name here. This can also be called between groups or within groups because maybe you you don't involve uh, humans and you change uh, things uh, with, with things, with, with items, with pieces of interface. So uh, let's speak about participant because it's easier also to grasp, but the same concept may apply in different contexts. We have two types of experimental method, the between subject and the within subject. In the between subject, you have each participant that performed the experiment under only one condition. So you have one participant that is doing the task for the three items menu. And then you say goodbye and you have another participant that will have the, uh, the task with the five item menu. Then you say hello and you have a third participant that he, will do the task with the uh, seven item menu if you have just one independent variable. If you have the two independent variables before, you will have six different participants that will perform just one task, with just that condition. The textual three item menu. And then another participant that is doing the textual plus icon three menu item. This is between subject. You have separate subject that don't see all the comparison, just one condition at a time, just one condition in their life. Uh, you have some positive aspect of this and some negative aspect of this, except time, obviously. For sure you need more user. If you have six, six conditions, you need six users, six participants to just have one full comparison. So you maybe to have 10 comparisons, you need 60 people, quite a lot. Moreover, uh, groups have to be balanced. You cannot have 20 people in the first condition, five on the second, five on the third, five. You, uh, you should have the same kind of people, the same number also people for all equally distributed in the same condition. And you cannot have, for instance, if, the, if age is a factor, you cannot have, if age is a factor, you cannot have all the young people in the first condition and all the 80, 80 years old on the second condition. Because obviously things may change if age is a factor. Or just see, just see things or react with things differently. So you have groups balanced. And all possible user variation can also bias results. Young people versus people with older people that maybe have some uh, less familiarity with some kind of technology that you are experimenting. So if you if you got only one kind of people in a specific condition, you may have some different results. On the positive side, there is no transfer of learning. Do you know what is transfer of learning? 
you can imagine what is transfer of learning. There is no transfer of learning in these methods between participants. Which learning cannot be transferred here? We will keep this for later because in the within subject there is transfer of learning. So you maybe understand what it is and then I will give you the answer. In the within subject, you have each participant that perform every condition. So you have participant number one that see condition number one, participant number one that see condition number two, all the six conditions for the same participant. Then you have another participant that uh, go through the entire comparison, six different kind of menus with text versus icon. Mm -hmm. It's obviously uh, less costly um, and you need way less user mm -hmm. because in, in the between subject you need to uh, if you need to uh, if you want to have 10 com full comparison you need 60 people here you need 10 people because everybody do everything so one six um, it's also less likely to suffer for user variation because you have a small population, easy to, to control. You don't need to balance group because you don't have groups. You have just one big group that do everything. Uh, within subject are also called repeated measure because you have one participant that repeat the same measure, the same task six, six times in our, in our example. And so it's a repeated measure. And here, transfer of learning between condition is possible. So in the between subject, no transfer of learning between condition. Here we have transfer of learning between condition. So this transfer of learning, what is? Second time must he knows how it works. The second time he know the interface, he know that there is a menu, there is some textual uh, before. He already see. In the sixth time, he already know that we, he, he, the participant experimented with a three item menu textual and icon then he experimented with five textual and, and, uh, and icon so it imagine that at that point he will have a seven menu with before text and after icon because it's something that he already the participant already see so there could be some transfer of learning the task could be easier in the end respect to the beginning because he already know what what you expect in the first one, this between subject, you don't have transfer of learning because in each condition you have a different person. So it's impossible to have transfer of learning. In the second, you, you may have, and this is a problem, and you can obviously uh, minimize this problem. Uh, and these are the two main methods. When more than one independent variable is present, it's possible to mix this thing. So for instance, one independent variable is placed between subject and the other within so you have for instance in our case as an example you may have the three the, the number of menu item as a between condition and the other one as a between so you get one person for these two conditions the textual versus icon and then you have another person with just the textual for the five and then another person with both the textual and the icon condition. This is a mixing. You're using the number of item menu as between subject and the uh, type of labels as within subject. So you're mixing one variable is between and the other is. It's, it's a compromise if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of condition just to avoid people having an endless session with a lot of, uh, you need more people that are on within, but less people that all between. And it's called mixed design. Between mixed with within, in any case, it's mixed design. So when to use one and when to use another one. So you have some, uh, some cases in which you are forced to use one uh, design, one methodology, and cases in which you have another methodology. So for instance, can you imagine a case in which 
you are forced to use a between subject. You cannot do differently. Think about participant, groups of participant. Think about, let's say, a separate group of participants that typically are not uh, uh, mixed together. If you want to see, for instance, whether a certain function of your application, uh, female use this application or this function uh, in less time than male, you, you cannot have a within subject. You cannot have a, a female participant and say, okay, now you're male, change, or vice versa. So we'll per ob you have to have a between subject. So you have a group of female that is testing the, the independent variable and another group, more or less balanced, more balanced than less, of male participants of same age, same attitude, same hobbies, same more or less the same, but male that is testing the app. So this is just a case in which you have uh, between, and there are also cases in which you can have only uh, within subject. You cannot, for, for the design of the study, you, cannot, you, can, you can also always have a within subject. So uh, between or within, typically within is much more used than between also because it requires less participants in practice. They are more or less equivalent. Uh, obviously, a within subject design requires less participant. You reuse the participant for each condition. Uh, it also, a within subject exhibit the same pre predisposition across different condition. If I'm annoyed, I'm annoyed in step number one and the condition number, seven, number six. If I'm happy, I'm still happy. Uh, if I have some other things in my mind, I will have for probably the entire test. If I'm engaged, I will be engaged probably for most of the test. If you change person, you don't know all this predisposition across the different conditions. Obviously, you'd have no need to balance group of participants. You don't have group of participants, you have just one. Transfer of learning, that is one, the, one of the two main pro problems is possible and is not desider desired. Uh, transfer of learning we defined before. Participant may perform better on the second condition, the sixth condition, whatever it is, because the benefit from practice from the previous condition. And also fatigue may be an issue. Mm -hmm. So longer test, the last condition you want to finish and go home and stop clicking on menu item. Mm -hmm. So this also could be an issue. Counterbalancing, this is something that we will cover next time, will help to minimize the learning of effect. So the idea of counterbalancing is assigning different condition, the condition a different order. So for instance, you have for the first participant, condition number one, then two, then three, then four, then five, then six. Participant number two will have condition number six, five, four, three, two, one. Participant number three will, have three will have condition one, three, five, then six, four, and two. So you mix up things, mix up condition, just to try to minimize the practice effect. That will be some practice effect, but it will be different because the first participant will have one, two, three, four, five, six, and the second one will have six, four, four, six, five, four, and so on. So they will change this and this minimizing the practice effect. So we will continue with this counterbalancing with these wonderful tables uh, next week, because again, tomorrow there is no class. Um, on Thursday, there is the lab that is again f about uh, start writing your usability test scripting and the text of the lab will be online tomorrow probably uh, before tuesday for sure 
and the, in the text there will be also the some instruction how to perform the usability testing in addition to what is already written in the slides and the template for milestone number four that is already that is given by the exam do you have any question have a good night then <laughs>